uh, if you don't mind, we're going to make a start. Um, and I'm, I'm enormously grateful to um, Matt Oakman, who is the um, deputy head at Wellington College, and Dr. Michael Gray, who is the director of studies at Harrow, for joining us this evening. What is the purpose of this evening? Well, um, as a parent of, of old children, I've been through, um, mercifully, the experience of choosing a school for my children. Uh, and I know some of you are about to embark on choosing a secondary school for your sons. Um, and just to try and help you survey the landscape and get a sense of what are the key factors in any decision that you make. Um, it's not uncommon for parents to come back and share feedback with me. Um, and, and the things that, that generally rate very highly are um, the facilities, um, the, the headmaster of the, of the next school, the quality of the boy that you meet who shows you around, or any other factors. But those three tend to be quite significant. Uh, and it strikes me that there is one very, very important factor that's missing. And that is understanding the curriculum framework that your son will uh, engage with and benefit from when he joins that particular school. Uh, when I went through um, education, quite a few years now, um, there was one recognised model, and that was GCSEs and A-levels. It isn't the case any longer. There's IGCSE versus GCSE, IB, A-level, pre-U, uh, and each of them offer something really distinctive, but also very important for your son. And I'm really, I really want to encourage uh, every parent at St John's to engage in understanding the potential benefits of this. So. Um, Mr. Oakman is going to talk in a, in a short while about the IB, the International Baccalaureate, how that is structured, the kind of boy, the kind of child that will, that will benefit, um, and why might that be of interest to you as parents when you're considering those key factors in a secondary school. Mr. Gray is going to very kindly talk about uh, GCSE, IGCSE, A-level, pre-U, um, and that kind of thing. Uh, they come from a position of experience. They run the academic programs at their school, so they are the best people to come and talk to us this evening. So, um, uh, uh, Matt, thank you very much indeed. Michael, thank you uh, sincerely for your time. We will be stopping um, uh, on the nose of 7.40. I know you've got sons to get into uh, uh, to bed, uh, and that's, what we, that, that's the time frame we've set for this evening, and that's ample time to delve quite deeply into this. So without further ado, uh, Michael, would you mind kicking off, please, um, and just talking about A-levels, GCSEs, and the like? You're welcome to share your screen with us. Perfect. Thank you very much, Charles, and thank you very much for um, uh, jo joining tonight, and I hope you can all see my screen okay. And I'm really delighted, Charles, to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you also for putting the emphasis on the curriculum. And this is something that's really important to me and really important to what we've been doing at Harrow over the last 18 months or so. Because what we've been doing is conducting a no assumptions curriculum review. And at the heart of what we've been trying to do is to really think what is it that students need moving into the 21st century? What is it in terms of making sure that they're maximizing their employability and so forth? So we've been asking lots of questions and in terms of the curriculum we were really keen to try and be as open-minded as possible and to think what qualifications do people need as, as they move forward into the second half of the 21st century. So rather than have conversations just with educationalists and in a kind of internal perspective we sought to go out quite widely in terms of um, speaking to different people. So we've spoken to lots of HR directors from FTSE 100 companies. We spoke to lots of, of executives. We spoke to um, lots of, of leaders from around the world from lots of different spheres. And we asked them to really think about these different aspects, what qualifications students wanted, what skills and attributes. And obviously that's important in terms of the relationships with the curriculum as well and how they relate to university and employment, and also within the context of the wider world. So we talked to people from all different sorts of, of, of groups. We talked to um, leaders in, in, in a wide range of companies from a wide range of different sectors. And um, we reached some certain conclusions. And uh, Harry, of course, historically, has always done GCSE and A-level. And we 
had really a license, we had a, a clean slate to be able to make some really fundamental changes if we wanted to. We really had um, the green light from governors to, to make changes if we thought that was the right thing to do. So we spent 18 months leading on this and I was, I was leading on this, on this curriculum review and mindful of the national context that in some ways it's quite, it's quite trendy to, to change one's curriculum. And there's a lot of rhetoric and a lot of opposition in some quarters to GCSEs in particular, and to some extent to A-levels. Uh, but after careful consideration and consultation, we actually made a bold decision and it was bold insofar as it was continuity rather than change. And a change in many ways seems the thing that if you're conducting an 18 month curriculum review, you should be making some fundamental changes to the qualifications that you're delivering. But we actually concluded that GCSEs and A-levels were very much the right thing for us to continue with. And one thing that came back in stereo from employers <coughs> was the importance of GCSEs as a passporting qualification. It's not that they provide you with everything that you need to be real world ready. There's lots of other things that are needed, but they're vitally important in order to, uh, to get your foot in the door, to get that interview, uh, to get the job. And it was almost taken uh, for granted that this was something that was vitally important. You mentioned Giles around GCSEs and IGCSEs. At Harrow, we do a combination of both. We adopt a very liberal curriculum insofar as it's very much up to the head of department whether they want to take an IGCSE or a GCSE for, for the boys, whether they, which exam board they use and so forth. So there's a lot of autonomy. And what we want to do is we want to make sure that the boys have the best curriculum, the curriculum that's the most enriching, the one that's most rigorous, the one that's most exciting and, and best in preparing boys for the next phase of their education. So we don't really get hung up around GCSE or IGCSE and different subjects will do different ones. And if they if there's a new specification in another in the same subject with another example, then they may look to change if they think that's preferable. So we certainly do a combination of GCSE and IGCSE. And again, there's quite a lot of political narrative around this, but certainly in in the in the um in the analysis that we've done, we're confident in the robustness of both, and we're very confident in the way that both universities and employers view GCSEs and IGCSEs um, in parallel and, and in harmony, as it were. Um, but in terms of some of the arguments for GCSEs, I think one reason why a, a, six, a terminal 16 um, plus a qualification is vitally important is because if students are able to get really good grades, then it seems a little bit odd to not do that. Some schools move away from GCSEs, some schools will offer very few GCSEs or, or, or no GCSEs at all, a kind of a, a homemade a qualification as it were. Uh, but I think that if boys are able to get lots of grade nines, and we're, we're fortunate at how that, that our boys are, then it seems a little bit odd for them not to be able to get that on their CV, because I think it's really vitally important in, 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 a, in a, an employment context. I think also there's a lot of narrative against GCSEs in the press and a lot of independent schools are keen to champion the abolition of GCSE. I think that's unfair. I think one of the things that's vitally important to remember is that a third of students nationally don't take A-levels. And while in the independent sector they do, that's not, that's not true nationally. And therefore, if they're not taking A-levels, they may leave without, without um, some really important qualifications in key subjects like maths and English. It's also worth noting that in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, the school leaving age is still 16, even though that's not the case in, the, in, in England. So I think a terminal assessment is really important and useful for preparing students for assessments that they may have later on in life, whether that's in, 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 um, in the field of law or field of banking. There's so many qualifications and exams people will need to take in an employment context. But one of the things about the sixth form is again going on to A-levels and there's a choice between pre-U and A-level and we used to take a few subjects in pre-U, not least for in the languages, um, which uh, where we, we felt the pre-U was a little bit more robust and a bit more rigorous in its approach. But the pre-U is, is ceasing to exist from 2023. And um, those schools which previously ran pre-U um, are then having to make a decision between A-level or IB. But a lot of that was driven really, I think, by, by financial restraints, uh, not least of all, um, 
with, with the organization that runs the pre-U. But we had very few subjects doing pre-U, really just, just the languages, art and history of art. But they're all reverting back um, to back to uh, back to A level. Um, in fact, they've reverted back from the lower sixth from this year. Um, so we, we've made those changes, but we're big supporters of A-levels. We boys start with four A-levels. Most boys, when a good number of boys, continue with four all the way through. One of the problems, of course, with A-level is it doesn't offer the breadth that some other subjects do and um, some other qualifications do, sorry. So obviously IB offers a great deal of breadth. What we try to do is we try to put a lot of breadth in our curriculum in other ways, not least of all around our electives program and through supercurricular components. But again, I think um, A-level is a really important qualification. They're very rigorous. And I think they align very neatly with a UK university system, whereby people specialize at degree level in the way that maybe they don't in the US through the liberal arts program. And therefore going into a subject in greater depth is very helpful for students who then want to do that subject at university. Of course, some students don't know what they want to do at university and don't know what, what subjects they want to do um, at A-level. And, and having to specialise early um, may, may not suit everybody. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's, it's really important to be able to offer, if you do offer an A-level curriculum, to also offer, offer um, breadth as well. And I would, I would um, say to parents looking at different schools, and I'm not just talking in a Harry context now, I'm talking more, more widely, to make sure that those schools which offer A-level <coughs> offer breadth as well through other aspects of their provision. And um, in, in conclusion, one of the things that really came forth from our um, curriculum review was these different literacies. And we're looking to see how we can embed and map these across all the different areas of school life in the co-curriculum, the super curriculum, as well as the core curriculum. So one of the problems again with, with, with a lot of qualifications and the pandemic has shown this last year in particular is the idea of a terminal exam. And that's obviously a little bit at risk if one can't physically take the qualifications and the assessments. So the terminal nature of GCSE and A level is, is something which um, the government and, and, and the exam boards may need to consider if, if we live in an increasingly disrupted world. But certainly I think there, there's something for every, everyone in GCSEs and A-levels, not least all around choosing the right combination of subjects. And um, there's lots more I, I could say, I'm mindful of time, but hopefully there'll be an opportunity to, to answer any questions that anyone should have on any of that. Um, Michael, thank you very much uh, for that very succinct but helpful over, overview. Um, I think before we take questions, if, if you don't mind, um, I'll hand over to uh, Matt, who is going to just outline um, the IB and how that might work. And then towards the end, um, we can we can bring some questions together. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, it, lovely to uh, have the opportunity to uh, speak to you all this evening. Um, I wouldn't disagree with a, a lot of what um, Michael has said there. You know, indeed, we do uh, the same amount of GCSEs. We do the same mixture of national GCSEs and IGCSEs. Um, and as a school that offers a dual curriculum in the sixth form, both A-level and IB, we also hugely value A-levels and everything that they give our students. Um, I guess where we are different and unique is in that we offer a dual curriculum in the sixth form. Uh, our students have the opportunity to choose whether or not they're going to study the IB or indeed the A-level programme. Just because IB might be the less familiar uh, curriculum uh, for some of you. I thought it'd just be useful to quickly explain what it is. Um, all students do six subjects uh, for the International Baccalaureate. They do three at HL, high level, and then three at standard level. And in addition to the breadth and depth that you get from those six subjects, there is also three other elements to the IB, which are compulsory for all students. Everyone embarks on a theory of knowledge course, uh, which results in an essay and a presentation at the end. Everyone also embarks on the extended essay, which is a 4,000 word uh, piece of research uh, on their chosen topic and study area, uh, which is excellent for sort of uh, personal statement and university options as well. And everyone has to fulfill the community action and service program, which in many ways are the normal uh, kind of activities that students would be engaged in, whether they're at Wellington or Harrow, uh, but it formalises the necessity for that, which is a, 
uh, a, another uh, positive factor behind the IB. It values what you do beyond the curriculum as well as what you actually do within the curriculum. So what are the benefits of the IB? Well, Wellington made a decision uh, back in uh, uh, 2007 uh, that it was going to introduce the IB. Uh, and our first students sat their IB exams back in 2010. So we are very much well uh, embedded in terms of being a school uh, that offers both IB and A-levels. So for us, the benefits are considerable. Um, and I've highlighted some of these here for you on this slide. The fact that it combines the depth that you get with the three higher levels with the breadth by also doing three standard levels as well as well as the EE, the TOK and the CAS. In our view, it is a more globalised and international curriculum uh, and therefore more 21st century proof. It's also very interesting to note there's no grade inflation in the IB and hasn't been for 30 years, which gives it a solidity, not just in terms of the UK market, but also the international market. It's also very well internationally recognised. It's not to say that A-levels aren't, they are. Um, but I think it's worth noting that when you fill in your common application uh, for uh, American universities, there are two options. Uh, it's uh, APs or the IB. There isn't an A-level option, which kind of just shows you, uh, I guess, the extent to which, uh, uh, particularly for American universities, whereas Michael alluded to, uh, the liberal arts programme is the one that's predominant, uh, the IB sits very neatly uh, indeed. Um, and for example, we have over 30 students a year who go off to American and Canadian universities. But for us, I guess it's the next bullet point, which is key. The fact that every student has to carry on with maths, English, a language, whether that's modern or ancient, a science and a humanity subject. And in addition to those five core areas, which everyone has to fulfill, the sixth subject can be a second language, a second science, a second humanity, or indeed it can be a creative or performance-based subject. So if you're a science specialist, you can still take that route. If you're a linguist, you can still take that route. The other benefit for many of our students is there's coursework in every subject. Um, now that's not for everyone. And indeed, actually that's why some of our students might choose A-level rather than IB. But many actually like the fact that there is more continuous assessment in the IB than A-level. Some A-level subjects have coursework, but not all. There's also what I call the tough IB and the strategic IB. Um, the tough IB may well be maths higher level, physics higher level, chemistry higher level, etc. But they can also take a slightly more strategic IB, um, where for certain students, uh, actually it might be a case of picking the right framework of subjects in order to enable them to get into the 32 to 37 point bracket, uh, which will get you into a sort of good lower level Russell Group University. It's also the diversity of the curriculum uh, that is on offer within the IB. ESS, Environmental Systems and Societies, Psychology, which we offer at IB, but not at A-level, Visual Arts. We're also now looking to introduce in the next couple of years, Anthropology uh, and Film Studies as well. And just to show you a little bit in terms of the IB story at Wellington, um, you can see that in 2010, our very first year of examinations, uh, the average point score was just over 35. Since 2014 onwards, effectively it's been 39 plus, and indeed in the last two years, 40 plus. Uh, and if you consider that the average Oxford offer is 38 to 40 points, that gives you a sense of the average Wellington student in terms of their uh, IB outcomes. And it's worth noting that uh, the university offers, which when we started the IB in 2010, were not aligned with the difficulty and demands of the IB, now are. Uh, we had to fight hard in the first few years of the IB with certain universities to ensure that they pro properly recognised um, and understood the difficulty levels of the IB, not least the fact you were doing six separate subjects plus the other demands. Now they are properly aligned and we feel they're very fair in terms of the university offers that are made. Uh, and just a few examples there to show that. Medics tend to be around 36 to 38 points, standardised offer. Oxford is 38 to 40, 
KCL a few years ago uh, reduced their IB offer from being a standard of about 38 down to 35, 36. Exeter, again, a good mid-range Russell Group University, tends to hover between 36 and 38 for its most popular courses, just to give you a sense. I thought it'd be interesting just to show you a slide in terms of how things have changed at Wellington in terms of IB and A-level numbers. Uh, as you can see there in 2010, the first cohort uh, hovering around 20% uh, of the year group doing IB. And you'll see that over the subsequent 10 years, the IB has now overtaken the A-level uh, and is now the most popular of the two courses. We have 51% doing the IB and 49% doing the A-level which is a wonderful place to be in because it means that the dual curriculum offering is genuinely that. Uh, there isn't a sense that, oh, X student is definitely gonna do the IB and Y student will definitely do the A-level. We go through a really rigorous subject choices process in the fifth form, year 11, uh, and students get that wonderful opportunity to take a step back and to think about what kind of learner they might be what kind of curriculum they're most suited to, whether it might be A-levels or whether it might be the IB. And actually in terms of the A-level, just very briefly, uh, for Wellington students, most students will do three A-levels and they'll do the extended project qualification, the EPQ, uh, which is the sort of A-level equivalent, if you like, of the extended essay within the IB. So we've tried to make sure that uh, both curricula uh, are as rigorous as each other. The future of the IB for us, well, we will continue to offer both. Um, that's absolutely set in stone. There, there, there isn't a sense that uh, we will be full IB or full A-level again. Uh, for us, the dual curriculum offering is one that we will certainly retain. We see it as a genuine opportunity for student and indeed parental choice. Uh, choice is probably one of the most important words in terms of the Wellington curriculum. Uh, we have diversity and choice throughout everything that we offer uh, in terms of our elective subjects in year nine, five different languages to choose from, uh, and it's embedded therefore also within the sixth form offering. And as I've said, 51% now take the IB, and we project that will probably rise to about 60% uh, by about 2023-24, and we'll probably then flatten out at that point, uh, and it will probably end up at 60-40 or thereabouts split. Uh, probably for the next kind of uh, decade uh, or so. We are looking to introduce more subjects into the IB uh, because it allows us to do so. Um, and one of the benefits in COVID times has certainly been that whereas A-levels obviously in the summer of 2020 suffered huge grade inflation um, as a result of centre assessed grades, CAGs, the IB didn't. The IB retained uh, its kind of standards in terms of a seven being a seven, uh, 45 points still being 45, uh, and a real sense therefore of uh, certainty in uncertain times. Um, because it'll be very interesting to see what the government uh, uh, will be announcing tomorrow uh, in terms of uh, exams, summer 2021. So hopefully that gives you a brief insight into the IB, uh, why uh, we do it, uh, but why we also do A-levels as well, because we still feel they are equally valuable, but we like the idea of student choice. Um, my email address is up there. Um, please do feel free to ask me any questions you'd like at any time. I'm always happy uh, to talk about the IB and A-level and our dual offering at the sixth form. Matt, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, are there any, I mean, I've certainly got a couple of questions, but are there any questions at the moment? Um, I think you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think you can raise your hand or simply turn your microphone on if you have any questions you'd like to ask either to Michael or Matt. Okay, well, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll probably kick off. Um, then, uh, Matt, you mentioned a comment about the uh, IB being more global and international. I mean, there's there's two ways of looking at that. There's there's a sense of does it give does it give the pupils a more global perspective in terms of the universities they'll try, or is the curriculum more globally aligned 
in terms of whether it's politics, whether it's geography or what. So can you just outline a little bit more about what you mean by making it more global? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's really interesting because uh, like many schools at the moment, we are looking at the diversity of our curriculum, um, given sort of the events of 2020. Um, and some of our students within the sort of global citizenship, which is one of our service strands, are actually doing an analysis of the difference between the A-level and IB curriculums in certain subjects. And one of the things they've already uncovered, which we already knew, is that the IB is less Euro centric uh, in terms of its curriculum content, certainly less UK centric. Um, and if you look at politics, for example, whereas at A-level you'd study politics A-level, which is basically UK and American politics. The IB is global politics. That is what it's called. It just gives you a sense of what the IB see as being important in comparison to the A-level. I'm a historian. Um, so for example, I teach mainly the IB and the IB is much more about kind of uh, history across all continents. Um, we do a lot of African history. We do a lot of South American history. Um, whereas if you look at the A-level history content, it is much more traditional perhaps uh, in its scope. So I would say that uh, not only is the curriculum itself much more globalized, particularly in those kind of key humanities and social sciences, but it does also lead on more naturally to an international uh, opportunities at university as well. May I just come in on that, Giles, if I may? Um, just to dispute a little bit, um, if I may, the, the comment on the politics, not least as a politics teacher and former head of politics at Harrow, um, we teach global politics as part of the A-level specification. So there's an option between the US or, the, or global. So actually teachers do have that choice. And I think it's also worth saying that there are quite a lot of international aspects to the A-level too, um, not least of all around um, the geography specification, which has a lot of case studies, a lot of boys, for example, at Harrow doing case studies on Latin America and so forth. Um, I think the point about US universities is, is an important point to think about global trends. And it's certainly the case that a lot of, of students from UK schools are going to the US. We certainly find that at Harrow where a quarter of boys go to US universities and certainly in terms of the AP programme or, or IB, A-level is constituted as part of an advanced programme. It's seen as an AP course by US universities who are very familiar with it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I, I think what, what, it, what, what um, my question contextualised, which you've answered, both answered really well, is that I think when some schools talk about a global uh, curriculum what they talk, or, or global access, they're talking about transatlantic access and talking about American and Canadian universities when when I think it, it, it's nice to know that as they as these as the boys and girls in your case are, are going to be educated um, that they're being educated in, in a in a truly global sense so thank you um, I, I'm interested um, in because um, I'm, I'm asked this question occasionally um, is there uh, again sorry this one's to um, to Matt but when you're looking at the IB um, is there a kind of a trend in the, in the kind of the, the character or the temperament of the pupils that tend to choose IB. Um, I mean, there, there, there is a kind of a, um, perhaps you'll, you'll say it's a fallacy that the IB is harder work. There's more to do. And therefore, you know, the, the slightly work shy um, candidates will, will, will tend to drift towards the A-level because you can just mug it up at the end. And so is, is there a kind of a, just a, a quick answer, a quick kind of character trend on that? Yeah, I think it's very interesting uh, and a really good question. Um, and it's changed actually over the sort of 10 years or so that we've now been offering the IB. Uh, the IB does favor those that are organized, um, those who have a sort of consistent approach to their studies uh, over the course of the two years of the sixth form. Um, and it's probably fair to say that the majority of our IB students, but certainly not exclusively, tend to be more the humanities, social scientists, who also are quite good at languages um, and quite good at maths. Um, so it tends to be those kind of students. Plus, interestingly, though, the medics. Most of our medics do the IB. Um, and so they'll do sort of biology and chemistry high level. Um, some will do maths at high level, but most of them will then do maths at standard level. 
they'll probably do psychology at higher level. Um, and actually the medical schools love that kind of roundedness uh, of still sort of science at the, the high levels, but also other elements they're bringing into the mix as well. So it's been interesting, but our further sort of mathematicians, further mass, mass, computer science, design, engineering, uh, those who also got a sort of package of subjects that really, you know, are going to work well together, maybe three sort of discrete subjects uh, may well tend to go to the A-level because that will certainly suit them uh, perhaps much better, um, which is why for us the dual offering is, is, is key and fundamental. Thank you. Uh, any other, uh, sorry, but, but I'll pass it back to, to our parents. Uh, is there anybody uh, there who would like to um, propose a question? I'll give it a few seconds. Not if it's called. So, can I just clarify with IBs? Do you actually take an exam or is it continuous coursework? Just, just so sort of just better understanding of. Yes. Um, so for most IB subjects, um, it tends to be that it's about 20 to 30 percent coursework um, and for higher level subjects uh, you will take three exams, three written papers uh, and for standard level subjects two written okay. papers. Um, okay. So it's a, it's a combination. Uh, English is the one that has the most coursework. Uh, it's 40 percent coursework and interestingly the coursework for English which is a compulsory component either at high level or standard uh, half of that is a written piece of work. The other half actually is an oral presentation, uh, right. which we think is fantastic because it's a different skill set, um, yeah. which uh, plays to the strengths of different kinds of students as well. Absolutely, of course. Yeah, I, that's great. Thank you so much. Any other? Uh <laughs> While, whilst people are, um, are, are thinking of their questions. Um, a question to you, Michael. Um, you, you talked about the, the no assumptions um, uh, review that you did um, and, com and, and the combination of that was that you needed kind of breadth and you, you chose the, the kind of the A-level and then underneath um, you kind of supplanted it with, um, with the kind of the, the, the richness and the diversity that, that you could say is, is in the um, is in the 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 IB. Um, it, perhaps if you can just um, dig a little a little bit deeper in terms of um, it, it strikes me that in a sense you've got your you've got your your A levels your three stronger then you've got your three lower. What, what was the, what was the particular attraction of keeping those kind of two separate systems, um, and and why why is that perhaps better for um, preparing a um, a child for for university. Yeah, thank you. academically, but also temperamentally, um, because yeah, I, I'm seeing my my daughter go to university now, and she's doing a subject where she's got to be able to write essays and do kind of technical stuff. Mm. Um, and and she was saying that she wished she had done an IB in the sense of just more essays, more exposure. So um, going to university, they, you know, some of these students are going to need to still have a, a wide variety of skills. So I'm interested just in understanding a little bit more about, okay, why ultimately stay with the, with the A-level? Yeah, I think that's a great question, thank you. And one of the things that's at the heart of, of Harrow is our, is our focus on breadth as well as on depth. And I think the A-levels certainly offer that depth. In terms of breadth, all our students start with four, a number of them start with five, in fact, a lot of our further mathematicians will start with five. Some boys do computer science off timetable. There's the odd boy who's therefore doing six A-levels, um, who are obviously some of the, the most academically able of, of the boys. Um, but they also have an electives program, which is compulsory in the sixth form and in, and in the removes and fifth form years 10 and 11. And the electives program is three periods a week in the sixth form. And that can be on a whole range of different things. And we have, about 50 different electives from which they can choose. So that might be on something like um, the art of programming. So for boys who maybe have never had the opportunity to, to code before, to really get to grips with that, or it might be super physics, which is undergraduate level physics for boys who want to go on and read engineering at university. So there's a whole range of different things. So you therefore get that breadth and that depth. And that's also really important in getting that global perspective as well. So one might be looking at the history of the Middle East, for example, as an elective and do three periods a week on that for a half term. And that range of opportunities there is really important. Then we also make 
for sure that all boys do project based work. So that might be the engineering scheme, which is vital for boys success in getting to Oxbridge and Imperial for engineering where we have a lot of success. Or it might be through prize essays. So a little bit like the extended essay in the IB and boys have the opportunity to do lots of prize essays. And where that's particularly useful is flagging that up with, with the particular Oxbridge colleges, for example, or different societies and organizations. So boys are often very successful in that. And that's really helpful for a boy. Let's say he's applying, I don't know, to a particular Oxbridge college for classics. If he's, if he's won or become highly commended in, in an Oxbridge college essay competition, that, that's really helpful. So I think what we find is there's all of that breadth in the super curriculum, the, the societies and, and all of those sorts of things. We get lots of, lots of external speakers. Um, we've had five G20 ambassadors in the, last, in the last two years come to the Hill. So I think the range of speakers and the quality of speakers that come help to also provide that, that perspective and, and that breadth. But also, as you say, I think it's really important. Boys have an opportunity to do essays. They have an opportunity to do, do practical projects and all of those super curricular opportunities and making sure there's protected time in our timetable to support boys with that's really important. But temperamentally, I think it's also important that we help boys to foster independence and that not everything needs to have a specific examination framework within it. It doesn't have to fit within an IB model. It doesn't have to be you have to jump through this hoop and jump through that hoop and jump through that hoop. But to give boys the autonomy and the independence to be able to say, actually, I'm really interested in drones. So they set up the Drone Society at Harrow or they're really interested in, in computer science. So they want to build a Raspberry Pi computer. So it's about giving them the freedom to be able to, to pursue their interests to the greatest possible extent. OK, so uh, breadth and flexibility and adaptability, I think, is mm -hmm. is, is what drove the is what drove the, the, the decision. Um, I, I'm going to let um, Matt, we, there's two minutes left, Matt, so I'm going to let you um, have the final word. So uh, is there anything you want to finish up with? No, ju ju just to say that, um, you know, obviously the A-level curriculum for us is, is, is one that we also value. Um, I'm obviously talking about the IB this evening because it's, uh, the second part of our offering, or but very much a dual and joint offering. Um, but the A-Level provides a really valuable set of qualifications in the curriculum for many of our students. Uh, and obviously we do all of those elements uh, that Michael alluded to uh, just now, uh, in addition to A-Level and IB. Um, and I guess for us, the key thing that uh, if you think your son might be interested in Wellington is that element of choice. Um, choice from year nine onwards uh, and really what is a fundamental choice in the sixth form um, and as I said earlier that opportunity just to take one step back from education uh, at the age of 16 and genuinely reflect on what kind of learner they are, uh, what they want out of the sixth form um, and having an option to go either into uh, an A-level or IB curriculum. Uh, and that is probably the most fundamental element that drives our academic program uh, uh, at Wellington. Thank you, Matt. I would just um, finish with one very brief um, reflection. I've, um, I, I keep in contact with a lot of the old boys who will come back from time to time or email me or we'll meet for a cup of coffee or, or whatever. And, and the reason I, it, this isn't just a, a random invitation to um, Matt and, and Michael. Um, of all of the schools our boys um, go to, I've noticed that the boys at Harrow uh, and Wellington are amongst the most engaging boys in terms of understanding the context of their learning, why they're doing something, where they're going, and, and the decisions that drive that. So underpinning what happens at these schools it, it doesn't strike me as being random that the boys are part of a part of that journey and I and I would encourage every single one of you when you're looking at schools is yes it's nice to have nicely mown gr gr grass and it's nice to have a beautiful building that you, you, you that you work in and a, and a charismatic headmaster but your, your son's day-to-day -day experience is going to be the thing that lights his fire, that gives him the intellectual curiosity and the, and, and the independence to move forward and make his own choices and make the most of his education. And, and it strikes me that this evening's conversation hopefully will have, will have just uncovered some of those factors that will now stimulate some, some different questions um, for you, maybe in private reflection, but also 
maybe in some of the questions you table uh, and pose to the schools when you when you look around. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, to Michael, thank you very much indeed. To Matt, really grateful to both of you. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, have a really lovely evening and thank you for joining us. <laughs>